Thank you, Dr. Stinson, for those kind words of greeting and introduction. My gratitude to the President as well for this opportunity to speak in today's chapel. I hum stumbled upon some letters that uh, some children had written to God. And as I read these letters, I found out that I really hadn't grown up very much over the years. But let me share some excerpts from these letters of children to God. Nan writes, I bet it's very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family, and I can never do it. <laughs> Denise wrote, if we come back as something after we die, please don't let me be Jennifer. <laughs> because I hate her. <laughs> if you give me a genie lamp, like Aladdin, I will give you anything you want, except my money, and my chest set. <laughs> Please send Dennis Clark to a different summer camp this year. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> Maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. <laughs> it works for my brother Larry. Thank you for my baby brother. But what I prayed for was a puppy. <laughs> I just haven't grown up all that much. Because you know what? Sometimes uh, thoughts uh, like uh, those of uh, Denise flood my soul. Don't let me come back as Jennifer Horton, because I hate her. I feel as though at times uh, the words uh, in the epistle to the Hebrews are spoken to me. I am not ready for solid meat. I still need to be nourished only with milk because my heart still identifies with what Peter said. There are people that I would prefer go to another summer camp. There are people that I still struggle to be around. My heart is still one that needs to be nourished with milk because I really haven't grown up all that much. I'd like some people to have their own rooms so they didn't have to be around me. Sometimes I get frustrated and confused when I pray for a puppy and God forces me to be in a relationship, a loving, self-sacrificing, compassionate, gentle relationship with another human being who I find it difficult to get along with. Maybe some of you do, too. That's one thing that I'm going to direct our attention to this morning is the topic of Christian love. But there's another topic that I want us to focus on just as much. I recall students and faculty at another institution saying things like this that really bothered me. I remember stumbling into a student center and overhearing a professor say to a student, God will never say to you, well done, thou good and faithful theologian. You know what, I, I think that's exactly what God is going to say to James Leo Garrett. 
I think that's exactly what God will say to Martin Luther and John Calvin, Athanasius, and of course, most loudly to Irenaeus. God loves theologians, and there is a degree to which he expects sound theology from all of us to the same degree that he expects compassionate, self-sacrificing love. I remember a student coming into my office one day, and he had just heard a lecture on the doctrine of the Trinity, and he comes in and he closes the office door, and he sits down and he says, Dr. Bingham, excited from the lecture on the triunity of God, I, I went to my, uh, uh, to my pastor, and I was excited about leading the students in my youth group into a biblical study on the doctrine of God as he existed in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And Dr. Bingham, do you know what my pastor said to me? He said, what in the world does the Trinity have to do with youth ministry? My response is absolutely everything. But unfortunately, American evangelicalism and unfortunately even components and constituents within the SBC struggle with appreciating the essential nature of doctrine and theology to the Christian life and to sound Christian relationships. And so these are my two topics this morning. On the one hand, I want to talk to you about love. Love toward each other. And on the other hand, I want to talk to you about doctrine. And I want you to see that in the mature Christian life, we are called upon equally to give our hearts and souls to sound doctrine and to compassionate, self-sacrificing love for neighbor. There is no place in the Christian life to weigh these entities on different scales. They must be balanced, perfectly balanced, in the mature Christian life. And so I invite you to come with me to John's second letter, the second epistle of John. It's uniquely titled because it finds itself between 1 John and 3 John. The Apostle John has left us with five inspired, inerrant texts. The Gospel of John, the Revelation or the Apocalypse of John, and his three letters. 2 John has no chapters, it's so short it only has 13 verses. But I want you to see that in the introduction that we find in the first three verses, the apostle, as he writes to a church somewhere in Asia Minor, is consumed with the unity of love and of truth. Exegetes will differ whether the lady and her children referred to in this text is a literal woman and her offspring, or, or whether John is using lady and children metaphorically for a community of believers. I go with the second. I believe it is a metaphorical reference to a community. But none of that will ultimately have any impact upon the meaning of the text upon which we will focus this morning. What I want you to appreciate, I'd like you just to allow your eyes to drift over the first three verses and see the number of times that truth occurs and that love occurs and the way in which they occur in unity, in interconnectedness. The elder, which is John's name for himself. He is speaking here as the mature believer, as the leader, as the apostle, as the disciple who is speaking forth with authority to this community. And notice that he introduces that he 
loves this community in truth. Notice that this is a pair. Notice that in verse 2, he emphasizes that it is for the sake of the truth which abides in us that he expresses his love for them. When you see truth with a definite article like this, the, we're talking about ancient Christian Orthodox doctrine. We're, we're talking about that compendium, we're talking about that collection of essential theological truth which separates us in belief from the pagans and which separates the Christian from the unfulfilled Jew. It is that essential body of truth that defines us in our Christian faith. And notice that it occurs again in verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. In three verses, John cannot stop himself from demonstrating to you that in his heart, in his mind, in his soul, truth and love are a pair, an inseparable pair. Think of them, if you will, as two sides to the same coin. Think of them, if you will, as bacon and eggs. Over easy, please. Think of them, if you will, as an old couple, married many years, taking a walk on a summer's evening, gently hand in hand, reminiscing on their years together. These two are inseparable. Let me put them in different words for you. You cannot have love that is distinctly Christian without distinctly Christian truth. Distinctly Christian truth is the bed for distinctly Christian love. It is the foundation. You cannot have distinctive Christian relationships without first being committed to distinctive Christian doctrine. You cannot have love, distinctly Christian affection, distinctly Christian sacrifice, without first of all having a distinctively Christian faith. Truth and love are inseparable. I know what the American evangelical wants to say sometimes. The same thing that that pastor said to my student, that doctrine simply gets in the way of Christian pragmatics. That, that theology complicates Christian relationships. That doctrine interrupts Christian ministry that it's divisive, that it's misleading, that it's misdirecting, that it's complicating. But for the Apostle John, truth and love are inseparable. What we believe will determine how we treat each other. In verse 4, he, he pays a kind of a sideways compliment to the members of this community. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth. That's a kind of a backhanded compliment. It would kind of be like one of you in, in inviting Pamela and me over for, for supper with you and your spouse and your children, let's say you have three or four of them, and you were to entertain us in your, uh, uh, in your, uh, uh, your living room for a while before dinner, you would uh, allow us to see your picture album, tell us a couple of stories about 
how and when you were married, how you met each other, or your names of your children, how they're growing up well, and then you were to invite us into dinner. And we all shared dinner at your table together, and your children that night, for some reason, were misbehaving. They were, they were not good hosts. They made dinner difficult. And it would be as if, as Pamela and I were leaving that night after we thanked you for dinner, we might turn to you and say, it was a pleasure having dinner with some of you tonight. <laughs> Indicating that some or most of you had been very difficult to have dinner with because you were not doing what you were supposed to do. This is what the Apostle John is saying to this community. I'm elated that some of your children are, are actually walking in the truth, that, that they are believing well and that they are loving well, that their doctrine is sound and their relationships to others is sound that their theology is trustworthy and that their actions and attitudes towards each other are loving. But John can only say that about some in this community because the rest of the community has moved away from that defining mark of unity, of truth and love, doctrine, and distinctively Christian relationships. Why? Why was it that this community somewhere in Asia Minor towards the end of the first century, what was it that caused love and doctrine to begin leaking out? Why was it that in this community all of a sudden, someone pulled the plug and this community no longer was loving each other but hating each other, no longer sacrificing themselves for each other but expecting others to serve them. Why was it that no longer could John talk to them about being sound and trustworthy in doctrine but to imply that they had gone off center in their doctrine? Why? Was this the case for this community? The first thing John does before he answers that question is to renew the ethical obligation that is upon them. This community has stopped loving each other. They become selfish. They become self-interested. They become irritated with each other. They don't want to go to camp with each other. They prefer a puppy to anybody in the congregation. They'd like everybody to have their own room so that nobody has to see each other, be around each other, attend to each other. This is what's happened. And so the Apostle John, in verse 5, points them again to the ethical essence of Christianity. It doesn't get any more complicated than this. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing you a new command, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. John could have made it complicated, but the essence of Christian ethics, the essence of Christian morality, the essence of the Christian obligation to other human beings beginning with the body of Christ is as simple and as profound as this. We are to love one another. Did you hear me? We are to love one another. This isn't something new. John defines it and identifies it as something old, something ancient, something antique, something that has been around forever. 
And of course, he's probably thinking here of of the words uh, of Leviticus 19, where we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is an Old Testament ethical obligation. It's not something that pops up in the new. In verse 6, he continues, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it, just like in the first three verses, he doesn't let you finish without recognizing and appreciating that in the Christian existence, there are two things that always go together, truth and love, doctrine and how we treat each other, faith and human relationships, he doesn't let you get away in verses 5 and 6 without recognizing that the ethic to which every Christian ought to renew themselves daily, moment by moment, is the Christian obligation to be true to the Old Testament and to the New Testament command that we are to love one another. Thinking of Leviticus 19, but... He's probably also thinking back to the days in which he was privileged enough to hear the incarnate Son of God speak to these things. Do you remember the words of Jesus in John 15, verses 12 through 13? This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that one laid down his life for his friends. You see, this is not an old commandment in two senses. One, it is an Old Testament moral obligation for the believing community. And it is a New Testament obligation to the believing community because the Lord Jesus Christ, the one through whom the Father created all things, The one who is eternal with the Father shares the same nature as the Father and who has joined us by taking on our flesh, bone, and blood, becoming like us in every way yet without sin. This Lord of Lords and King of Kings, this eternal judge of the universe, this is the one who spoke to him the words of commandment, love one another. And so John, in verses 5 and 6, has to make sure once again that the reader gets this because the readers throughout history have been so tempted to go elsewhere. Love is so hard. It's so much easier to go to our own rooms when we're around a person that we deem that it is hard to love. Love is so hard. Puppies are are so easy in comparison to people that we have to be around with, whether it's a student in class or someone else at the seminary community or whether it's in the complex in which you live. Maybe you live with someone in your own house that you believe it's hard to get along with, someone in your church. Love is hard. Puppies are so much easier. Different rooms is so much more convenient. For some of us, it's probably a daily prayer that if we come back as something else, please don't let me come back as so-and-so because I hate him or I hate her. And so what we do is we put the command to love in some convenient place that we rarely look into, except it comes to mind around those people that we find it easy to love, easy to be around, convenient to give ourselves for. And so the question, however, still remains, 
What happened in this early Christian community somewhere around the end of the first century that caused it to be in such a turmoil in regard to both what it believed and how it was treating each other that caused John to write this letter? What happened? Verse 7 gives us the answer. It may not be what you expect. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. For some people, when they read 2 John, they They find no way to get from verse 6 to verse 7. In verse 6, he's talking about the command to love, and then all of a sudden, he he starts talking about false teachers, and, and some are unable to appreciate the connection. But the connection is right there, and the connection has been previewed for you in verses 1 through 3. The reason in this community why these believers have stopped loving each other is because something has happened, first of all, to their truthfulness and faithfulness to Christian doctrine. False teachers have wormed their way into this fellowship. False prophets have have made their way in and they have doctrinally affected them by corrupting, in particular, one fundamental Christian truth. They have taught this community that the eternal Son of God, the one who has been with the Father from the beginning, the one who is eternal with the Father, the one who shares with the Father omniscience, the one who shares with the Father omnipotence, the one who shares with the Father omnipresence, the one who shares with the Father eternality, the one who shares with the Father omnibenevolence, this one did not join us in our flesh, bone, and blood. They deny the incarnation of the eternal Son of God. And something happens to Christian communities who deny or de-emphasize the reality that the eternal Son of God became like us in every way yet without sin. And what John is saying is that when you lose the emphasis upon the incarnation, when you lose the emphasis that the eternal Son of God who was eternally divine but joined himself with the humility of humanity, the mortality of humanity, the difficulties of flesh, the pain of blood, the brokenness of bone, when you de-emphasize or when you deny the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the first thing to happen is that love is vacuumed out of the community. Why? Because truth and love always go hand in hand. They're like bacon and eggs. They are an old couple in the evening of a summer night who have held hands for 40 or 50 years walking together once again reminiscing. You cannot separate them. You cannot divide them. If one happens to one, it corrupts the other. In the latter part of the letter, John will continue to talk about these false teachers and he takes them so seriously that that he will say that you are to keep them out of your home because they will corrupt your home. He he associates them with the antichrist because they are speaking against the true vision of Jesus Christ and his true identity. But I want to ask the question, why is it that the incarnation, believing that the Lord Jesus, who was eternally divine, joined us in the humility, the humiliation of being human. 
Why does the Lord Jesus Christ joining us in the meekness of humanity, the mortality of humanity, the brokenness of humanity, the hardship and weakness of humanity, why does that stand as an essential doctrinal truth to the distinctive Christian ethic of loving each other? Let me make a couple of suggestions. John doesn't treat it here in 2 John. He doesn't have the room. It's a very short letter. Think of it as a text rather than an email. Think of it as a tweet rather than a text. He says this in 1 John chapter 3. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. See, what John is saying in 1 John is that Love involves more than simple language. It's easy to say to someone, I love you. It's easy to pat someone on the back. It's, it's easy to say things to people as you walk away, but it's, it's hard to make sure that their larder is full, their, their gas tank is full, their financial needs are met that you are taking care of them if they're ill, that you are serving them in accordance with their holistic needs rather than merely in word or with tongue. And you see, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He joined us in our humanity, humbling himself, laying down his life so that the Incarnation is our necessary model for what it means to love. There is another item in 1 John. Verse 19 of chapter 4, we love because he first loved us. In 1 John, there seem to be two ultimate essential qualities to a distinctive Christian love. On the one hand, it includes doing things for others with our hands rather than merely with our tongues, helping people materially, helping people physically, in real ways serving and providing for their needs. It includes sacrificing ourselves, our own needs, our own wants, our own possessions, so that they are full, even if it means our own diminishment and renunciation of our own comforts. But thirdly, in verse 19 of chapter 4, it means that we are responsible to take the initiative. I don't know about y'all, but Sometimes I find it hard to take the initiative in my relationship with Pamela. If my feelings get hurt somehow, if I am the one who has wronged her and I still feel hurt, it takes a grizzly bear to, to get me to go to her and to initiate reconciliation because my little boyish pride and arrogance gets in the way, and yet the Lord Jesus is telling us in verse 19 that Christian love looks like God's love, which means that God initiated it without any expectation of return. Here are the three components of a distinctive Christian love which go hand in hand with a sound and complete belief in the incarnation. One, it reaches out to your brother or to your sister and it supplies for their physical material needs, even if it means that you lose something. 
Two, it requires that you enter into a humiliation that lays down your life in sacrifice without expecting or requiring anything in return. And thirdly, it means that you take the first step, you initiate reconciliation, you model and demonstrate love first. If you do these three things, then not only are you believing in the eternal Son of God who became flesh, bone, and blood, but you are acting and imitating Him in His love for humanity. Truth and love always go together. Theology is that thing which is the foundation for all of your relationships. Faith goes hand in hand with caring and meeting the needs of another. Father, I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave everything for us, who became like us in every way yet without sin, who humiliated himself, who initiated love towards us, and who met our needs not only invisibly and spiritually or emotionally, but also physically. We will be resurrected from the dead. You do, through him, multiply the loaves, and you will bring glory to our bodies. I pray that through the power of the Spirit, you would keep us sound in our faith, sound in our doctrine and that you would make us generous in our love towards each other. I ask it in the name of Christ.